okay so before i start that first know this is not an exam this is just an approach towards an exam okay and second point even in an exam the first and foremost is be relaxed answer what you know if you do not know anything then please tell you do not know to the examiner no need to bluff at any point of time and that is very very important if you do know if you want to understand the question better please ask the examiner the same okay i am not an examiner so my questions will be very simple then in, in the, the exam try to write the cases in the stipulated time don't over exceed it's very important that you stick to your times and examiners will be very particular about that write clearly once you know the case have a road map as to how you will proceed go with the basics now as far as this class is concerned <clears throat> this is how, how we plan to proceed i'll be presenting you four cases and a few spotters at the end after every image i will give you a minute to see it and then type the response in the chat section if wrong it's okay i'm still not your examiner we'll share i will ensure that this ppt is shared with all of you through uh, dr upendra don't worry about it don't keep taking photographs or screenshots or any of those this entire ppt will be given to you at the end all the images are from the net so it's none of my copyrighted ones so you can have it at the end of the session and if you have any doubts regarding any particular case in particular we'll keep it to the end in the last 5 minutes i hope i am clear upendra my audible is okay yes sir your yeah, audible sir okay now we'll go this is the first case a 30 year old woman presented with a tender mass in an anti cubital fossa as i said earlier one minute time for you people to observe and type in your responses yeah, ensure that uh, you answer to everyone or uh, at least uh, to dr Ma uh, major prakash p okay you can send him personal messages or uh, just select everyone and uh, ensure that everyone can see it will be better if it is in a group chat because everyone can see my response to them the same way yeah please please select everyone and then type the messages please sir are you able to see the chat sir we are getting yeah i am able to see yeah i am able to see yeah. okay sir okay so more, some people have attempted writing an answer it's a good effort i appreciate most of them have been on target so in most of the times whenever a case is being presented to you in an exam either it will be a short case or a long case always remember a short case will have mostly three the two modalities and a long case will tend to have up to three modalities this is only a guiding principle and it is not a mandatory rule it is up to the examiner as to how he or she wants to proceed having said that if i were to describe these two images how will i do it <clears throat> okay i will go with a remember keep it to the basics go by the normal standard descriptors don't uh, use uh, directly your diagnosis your descriptors are very very important because the examiner wants to know whether how whether you can describe the lesion and arrive at a conclusion it's your findings which are important not the diagnosis your examiner is testing your skills as to whether your work diagnosis even after so many years of experience people can be wrong but imagine the approach to a particular case is very very important so if i were to approach this case i will, how will i go about it i will say there is a well defined isoechoic to hypoechoic lesion seen in the sub, in the subcutaneous plane with no post acoustic shadowing or post acoustic enhancement the lesion 
as in the proximal part a linear hypoechoic line which is seen in this uh, first image on the left hand side by an arrow mark post uh, doppler the lesion shows color uptake predominantly along the periphery with a few small specks of color uptake in the center with this in mind what will be my diagnosis i know a few people have already answered it but still i will now want i have given the descriptors myself so i will want some more answers for those of you who have joined late kindly uh, respond in the chat box to whatever questions sir is asking please make it more interactive okay the mo most of you have tried to answer on the same lines i am very happy about it remember in the exam it's a descriptors which matter your diagnosis may be correct may be wrong it does not matter remember your descriptors should be very very particular and in this case i will also try to say you always try to add the negative findings also you should be mentally prepared in this the significant negative findings which i will write to add is no calcification in the lesion there are no cystic changes in the lesion and there is no extension into the joint cavity so these are three significant negative lesions negative points which i would like to raise now here is an mri of the same patient which was taken various sequences are there i will give you one minute i want you people to first identify the sequences and then i don't want the diagnosis i want you guys to first identify which are the sequences yeah please uh, only one person sequences yeah so yes sir yeah only one person has attempted uh, to give the sequences some more responses please okay uh, most of you have attempted it well and i am very happy about it uh, somebody had just typed in pdfs post contrast so post contrast pdfs is normally not done so don't try telling that's a pdfs post contrast so that will be a big fallacy okay so i'll now uh, tell you the images uh what are those so the initial two are pdfs images followed by a t1 non contrast image and on to the left is a t1 uh, axial post contrast and a t1 axial non fat sat axial images so as many of you have rightly mentioned there is a well defined homogeneously enhancing t2 hyper intense t1 iso2 hyper intense lesion 
and if you see in the t1 on the right hand side we can see some small hypo intensity areas within the lesion so given the background that it is a lesion which is seen in the anticubital fossa plus the fact that it is having a t2 hyper intensity t1 iso to hypo intensity with probably some cystic areas within and as we saw in the ultrasound image we saw a hypoechoic structure at the proximal part of the lesion the po so possibility are as many of you have rightly pointed out is a peripheral nerve sheet tumor so differential diagnosis has been narrowed down to the two one is a neurofibroma or a schwannoma the third is a very rare a ganglion cyst which is arises from the nerve sheath so in these three differential diagnosis which one will be favor first i will favor actually a case of schwannoma because of those cystic changes which are present on the uh, mri image which we saw that is the hypo intense fossa which we saw in the axial image on the right hand side okay so having said that what is the schwannoma <clears throat> schwannoma are also called as neurilemmas are benign peripheral nerve sheet tumors the important point is kindly understand the difference between a peripheral nerve sheet tumor and a central nerve sheet tumor they have different kind of uh, presentations the age the sex predilection everything are different for a peripheral as well as a central part okay and the peripheral ones are normally seen in the third or fourth decades of life they are commonly affecting the flexor surfaces which is in relation to the ulna or the peroneal nerves okay only 5% of multiple schwannomas are associated with nf1 majority of the lesions measure less than 5 cm in the periphery okay now i will ask you one question you have found out a person with a single schwannoma or a neurofibroma in the peripheral nerve sheaths should you investigate for neurofibromatosis can you people respond to that okay so from what i see on the chat line most of you are trying to say yes okay so i will probably uh, with a single lesion somewhere here and there uh, it is not advised because for every point of time what is as i said earlier only 5% of multiple schwannomas are associated with nf1 so 5% of multiple schwannoma so a single neurofibroma doesn't warrant a uh, further investigation for nf1 whereas if the same patient has got multiple neurofibromas please make it a point that you investigate especially if the patient is affordable okay any doubts on this case okay this was a relatively easy case so as i said what are the typical imaging features smooth well defined fusy form with tapering ends coursing along the nerve axis that's what i said a hypoechoic lesion which you saw on the proximal end of the ultrasound it is it can be eccentric but then if it's a neurofibroma it can be uh, centrally located also again it can be low or intermediate signal on t1 t2 weighted images it can be on a high signal <clears throat> in some typical cases we see the typical target sign here which we as a central low signal intensity on t2 weighted images now multiple other signs which is just for theoretical purpose in case you see them it's fine but in case if you don't see them it doesn't exclude the uh, lesion as such okay the most important point which you clinically should know and especially when a clinical ex thing is uh, mentioned is a look for signs of muscular atrophy this may or may not be mentioned during your examinations 
but then when you are in clinical practice which you will all do once you come down after finishing your md please do look up for signs of muscular atrophy if they are there please think in terms of a schwannoma or neurofibroma okay now we go to the second case a 29 year old woman with chronic intermittent pain of the abdomen okay now take a stern hard look and then i want your responses as you have a look uh, just uh, one more uh, suggestion please switch off your videos uh, we don't want to see all the videos coming in and disturbing in between so please switch off all your videos okay ensure they are all mute okay uh, to all the participants small request and please type in your responses okay so most of you are typing out the uh, diagnosis i want you to concentrate on your descriptors especially if all of you are exam going please concentrate on your descriptors please may I mention the study okay that is what is being looked at your diagnosis as i say this immaterial for 95 percentage of the consultants or the uh, examiners your descriptors your approach to the particular case is more important than what you diagnose okay so most of you have found the finding correctly it was a varium meal follow through okay it is not a double contrast varium meal as many of you have seen typing okay it is a varium meal follow through study okay as many of you have pointed out the jejunal loops are seen on the right side okay the same patients images now what is this study and what is that structure marked c okay i'm very happy with the amount of participation which is happening so yes you people are right the it is a double contrast barium study and the structure which is mark c is a cecum okay <clears throat> whenever you are seeing a barium study whether it's a barium uh, follow through or a barium meal or for that matter a barium enema it is very important for you people to identify these basic structures which is where is the pylorus located how is the pylorus located that is the first point second point concentrate on where the c loop of the duodenum is the third point look for the cecum and the associated cecal structures and if you get a better very good quality image look for the small bubble loops where are they located so these are the four points which you are pertinently have to see now 
this is not of the same patient but i want you people to attempt what it is have a full look no hurry don't rush into type your diagnosis okay just have a look it is not a diagnosis it is a very simple finding which i just want to elicit in this radiograph okay uh people have attempted but then i am not very happy with those uh, responses but then it is not a regular sign it is not a large bowel i just wanted you to observe it fully since the case as most many of you have diagnosed is something related to a rotation of the gut okay kindly see that the small bowel loops is on the right hand side and the large bowel loops are on the right hand side so on a plain radiograph if you find that this is the kind of picture always think there is something to do with rotation okay since you know, most of you have <clears throat> given this what is this and what is that arrow mark and what is the b and what is the significance of the image yeah so the uh, very good so most of you are understanding the situation or understanding the image very very nicely the purpose of this is whenever you are suspected with a bowel radiograph and if you are suspecting a mal rotation the first and most important thing on an ultrasound is to locate the sme and the smv the normal uh, presence is the sma is to the left and the smv is to the right so whenever there is a change in the relationship it is not necessarily there should be an inversion any change in the norm from the normal appearance of the relationship between sma and smv you should start in thinking in terms of a mal rotation okay a similar image where you can see that the cecum is now to the in the pelvis and with some small bowel loops which are lying down on the left iliac fossa region so the mal rotation can present with these kinds of very subtle findings which you may not always see so it is very very important for you people to start looking at the location of every small bubble loop or large bubble loops as i said the four different structures the pylorus the c loop of the duodenum the duodenal jejunal junction and the cecum so these are the four things that you should constantly look okay the ct uh, representing the same sma smv relationship which i wanted to highlight so since most of you have arrived at a diagnosis the ct may not be yielding much more information than what you guys have already done okay so there's a very good article which i am just mentioning it here a intestinal mal rotation in adolescents and adults a spectrum and clinical imaging by dr perry j picard and sanjeev bala anybody who has not read this article i just recommend that you guys read this article okay <clears throat> so what is mal rotation any deviation from the normal 270 degree counter clockwise rotation of the mid gut is called as mal rotation of the bowel it can be incomplete rotation or non rotation or mal rotation so in clinical practice the term incomplete rotation is hardly used and that has come to be normally represented as mal rotation so in clinical terminology or in day to day use an incomplete rotation and mal rotation mean more or less the same non rotation is quite rare but yes you can find a few cases so now the first question is what is root of mesentery can anybody tell me what is the root of mesentery and from where and to where it is Are you guys able to hear me? 
yes sir yes sir definitely we are able to hear you sir okay i am not seeing any response they are waiting sir i think we will get some responses shortly yeah yeah i sorry <clears throat> it is not small gut to retroperitoneum okay so a uh, root of the mesentery is a very important landmark for all of you to know and uh, you should be very particular about what you type you should be especially in the exams the ligament of treads or anything is not what they will expect they will expect it is the root of the mesentery which starts from the on the left side at the level of l2 and crosses across the midline to reach the right side at the level of the right sacroiliac joint these two words that is the l2 on the left side and the right si joint are expected okay so ensure that you people mention these two words without fail okay so that is very very important to answer the questions to the point they will expect especially for exam going students the words are very specific in the case of small rotation the root of mesentery is very very important okay what if i say the third case or the plain radiography image is a case of internal hernia so what is an internal hernia can i have some responses as to what is internal hernia okay definitions by nature should be as it is mentioned in the textbooks okay although most of you are trying to give me the point that you understand what is meant by internal hernias you the definition is a herniation of a loop of bowel or a bowel through any defect within the abdominal cavity okay it can be intraperitoneal it can be extraperitoneal but still it, internal hernia means it should be a defect within and it should not communicate with the exterior so it should be within the abdominal cavity okay so that is how it is goes and it is very important for many a times that you identify internal hernias also though they are rare and normally they are not kept on the exams but yes they are definitive spotters okay and there are four different types of internal hernias minimum which you should know which are seen around the duodenum okay so if the point to be noted in all those cases is uh, internal hernia is a close mimic of a mal rotation where the bowel loops again can be to the right side of the midline and it many a times the internal hernias are mistaken for mal rotation and vice versa okay so it is very important that you keep a open mind until a ct is done that uh, you are uh, 100% sure it is a case of mal rotation or paraduodenal hernia you don't arrive at a very confirmative response to the surgeon saying that this is this and that is that okay so that is a point to be noted here and what are bands of lad anybody excellent i got a very good uh, response from uh, from one dr malavika so excellent bear response so the bands uh, <coughs> lads band the fix the cecum to the retroperitoneum and it can go as i have uh, up to the right hypochondrial region so when the cecum is highly placed it can the lads band can cause compression and sometimes obstruction of the duodenum so that is the significance of the band, band of lads okay now when the 
case discussion goes to the level of amal rotation expect some questions on heterotaxy with uh, right isomerism and heterotaxy with the left isomerism that is asplenia or polysplenia i am just adding these because these are the scopes of discussion to which an examiner can go because these are closely associated all are mal rotational associated things so what is asplenia what is polysplenia i think you people should read about it in depth you should be having a clear concept about what is right isomerism what is left isomerism okay so as i am going here the spectrum becomes larger to include cites solitus cites inverses cites ambiguous with polysplenia cites ambiguous with asplenia these are the larger spectrum of a mal rotation of a mid gut where in the mal rotation we discuss only about the mid gut this involves the entire gut as well as the uh, associated structures that is the liver spleen and the lungs okay so few points about uh, mal rotation it is seen in 1 in 500 live births the key findings of mal rotation is an abnormal dj junction location <clears throat> on the radiograph frontal view dj junction fails to cross the midline to the left of the left sided vertebral body pedicle dj junction lies inferior to the duodenal bulb on the lateral view d2 and d3 segments of the duodenum not located posteriorly in a retroperitoneal position normally in today's time none of us take a lateral view so this is more theoretical so if an examiner is an old timer he or she may ask this so you may have to know that for exam purpose otherwise in practical terms lateral views very rarely taken okay in approximately 25 percentage of the case of malrotation the cecum is normally located so even if the cecum is seen in the right <coughs> right uh, iliac fossa region it does not exclude a malrotation so that is very very important for you people to understand as interested in no <clears throat> the embryo embryology there's a beautiful diagram which i'm presented to you the source which i have given you so anybody who's interested can read that article where the embryology of the mal rotation is very clearly mentioned again a few points or different types non rotation of duodenum where the duodenum and jejunum are seen on the right side mal rotation again where the duodenum is seen on the right side whereas the dj and the rest of the jejunal lobes are seen in the midline over the vertebra partial rotation means the dj is seen in the midline and the jejunal lobes goes back to the right side <clears throat> again dj is seen on the right side of the pedicle low dj these are various mal rotations and this is a spectrum clinically may, may, uh, it doesn't differentiate much but the point is very very important for you to note that the spectrum is so large that you have to pick up the uh, location of the dj in each and every imaging which has been presented to you especially in a bubble loop case especially the barium studies please try to locate the dj in every case it is very important that you locate the dj see it is in the correct position otherwise you will tend to miss that so as i said again in any barium studies which has been given to you the exam look for the site of the pylorus the shape of the pylorus the d1 uh, the c loop of the duodenum and the dj as well as the cecum so the point to be noted in any mal rotation case or suspected bubble loop case especially if you have been presented with a barium study please locate these structures if you locate these structures then 95% of the time your diagnosis will be on spot okay the waterloo for any modern radiology resident or even otherwise consultants okay the barium studies okay so i'll try to give you a few points about barium which can be asked and if an old timer is an examiner their knowledge of barium is abundant so we may not be able to match their acumen but there are specific textbooks where you can get enough knowledge about barium but what i am going to tell you about barium is the mandatorily which points which you should know okay discussion of barium is barium sulfate is the in, is the salt which is being used it is inert atomic number is 56 it is insoluble in water it is non toxic it gives very uh, good contrast in imaging 
and then it is relatively cheap. So these are the five points which any examiner will expect you to tell. And this is a chart of weight by volume of barium in various studies. This is also a must for all of you who are about to appear for exams. Please note the various weight by volume percentages. It is mandatory that you know all these things because any examiner who enters into barium is bound to ask you all these questions. A barium swallow is 60 to 150. A barium meal 100 percentage weight by volume. And then for double contrast, it's 250 percentage. BMFT 50 percentage. The barium enema use a double contrast is 100 percentage and single contrast at 20 percentage. I am sure many of you are not using barium paste nowadays. And, uh, and uh, most of you, I am 100 percent sure, will be using microbar or the solution which is being used. But then these are basics which you should know. Okay, now we move on to the third case. A nine year old boy with arm pain. Okay, one minute and I want the responses. Please concentrate on the descriptors. Okay, most of you have, are not attempting it in the proper way of descriptions. So as I go through the discussion of this study, I will try to give you the descriptors of this case. Okay. Okay. Okay, the same patient now has undergone an MRI. Okay, I'll proceed further. I am not giving to give the descriptors, but I want you to listen to what I'm going to tell. Okay, as and when I'm going to discuss this case, that time you will find to understand how a case of a bony lesion is supposed to be described. In this case, the descriptors, uh, I mean the differentials I will use for Langer cells, histiocytosis, having sarcoma, osteomyelitis, neuroblastoma, lymphoma, and uh, osteoblastoma. Okay. okay, as I said earlier, any of these could, be a, could have been a diagnosis, whereas this turned out to be a case of Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which was proven on a histopathology. Okay. I'll come back to this later. Okay. So the descriptors in any case, okay, first, whether it's a lytic lesion, or it's a sclerotic lesion. You should be describing this point first. Now, the next is where is the location in the body, whether it's in the upper limb or whether it's a lower limb, which is whether it's a femur, tibia, you have to mention the bone. 
and in the bone there is that whether it's the diaphysis epiphysis so that is the second location then the most important thing is the zone of transition whether it is a zo narrow zone or a wide zone of transition everything has got its own significance the narrow zone of transition means it's an abrupt ending it can be a bit more benign lesion or it can be a less aggressive lesion whereas a wide zone means it's a more aggressive one the periosteal reaction again a chronic osteomyelitis will present in a different way and acute osteomyelitis and acute periosteal reaction will present in a different way cortical destruction as i said again it's very important a cortical destruction which which can be a marked destruction or it can be a generalized fracture so it's very important that you describe whether there is any cortical destruction then in the bone and in the marrow whether it is centrally located eccentric located or just a cortical so these are also very very important then look at the matrix how is it, whether it's clear matrix whether it's ground glass matrix or whether it is containing any the calcific matrix or what is the kind of matrix that's very important again monoosteotic or polyosteotic so whenever a radiograph of bony lesion is mentioned make sure you address all these points eight points which is mandatory that you address all these eight in your descriptors so having said this can anyone now attempt to include all these eight and give me a good description of the radiograph i'll go back to the radiograph okay so i want you people to include all those points which i just described to you and give me a very good descriptor okay so now i'll just describe with you why we have chosen langerhans cells histiocytosis why not the rest okay in the, as we said it's a well defined lesion it is mostly lytic lesion sometimes it can have sclerotic margins it's often permeative that's the most important word in this lesion it's mostly permeative bevelled kind of lesion in the bone okay and uh, it appears hyperintense on stir and it can show enhancement okay the closest differentials in this case will be an ebbing sarcoma like you can see in this one there are ill defined osteolytic lesion in the diaphysis in a child but what was conspicuous in this child was the presence of a soft tissue lesion as such so the and plus the history of pain fever and uh, presence of leukocytosis these are common associations with ebbing sarcoma so whenever you find a case like this ebbing is definitely a differential diagnosis on these case a rarer one will include a non hodgkin's lymphoma okay osteomyelitis definitely you need to consider but then it can occur anywhere but then i will expect the bone more involved near the joints rather than the the middle of the joint because the spread is normally by a hematogenous spread so in a young child when there are most hematogenous areas include the metaphys epiphyseal uh, physeal plate and the metaphysis so i will expect the osteomyelitic changes to occur there first rather than in the, the central portion of the diaphysis <clears throat> okay so it can be highly permeative with cortical breakthrough abscess can be there and mra can easily pick up the lesion in the case of osteomyelitis okay so how will you approach first look at the age of the, the 
no need to copy any of these these are present in a radiology assistant but i wanted you to go through the pattern of recognition the cases i want you to approach the uh, lesion correctly your diagnosis as i said can be wrong but i want you to have a correct approach towards the case first look at the age of the patient and then look whether it's a well defined lesion like a well defined lytic lesion ill defined lytic lesion or a sclerotic lesion so accordingly the age wise and the lesions next look where is it located whether it's epiphyseal metaphyseal or diaphyseal so accordingly your differentials reduce further all these are present in the web no need to copy i will give you these things but i want you to observe again i'm telling you first look for the age and how what kind of lesion they are the next look at the location of the lesion whether where it is located in the bone and which bone is involved why which bone is involved again it's very very important that which bone is involved is also equally important not all lesions involve all the bones so which bone is involved is also important again with in relation to the age how which all lesions appear in which all ages okay so it's very very important that you identify see like a case of sim simple bones is it can be the central diaphysis non ossifying fibroma it's eccentric and it is located in the metaphysis osteodiastema it's cortical in location degenerative subchondral cyst epiphyseal location anirisable bones is central and diaphysial so you can see various lesions have particular characteristics okay now what are the patterns of periosteal reaction this is if any lesion of comes this is definitely what an examiner is going to ask whether it's a solid benign looking periosteal elevation a lamellated spiculated and a cords band understand these are the terminologies which you are expected to uh, mention in your uh, what you are writing that is in your answer sheet the words are very particular the solid periosteal reaction lamellated periosteal reaction spiculated periosteal reaction or cortman's triangle so if you mention these things you are bound to be in the correct direction the examiner will be very happy the same way with the matrix whether it's a chondroid matrix whether it's a osteoid matrix what is the kind of matrix you are going to mention that's also equally important a chondroid matrix generally points towards a cartilaginous tumor and the osteoid matrix generally points to a bony tumor so you are by mentioning the word osteoid matrix or mentioning the word chondroid matrix you are pointing towards what is the origin or what is the what is your suspicion as far as the lesion is concerned you cannot say you are having a chondroid matrix and you can you say osteogenic sarcoma same way you are you cannot tell you are having a osteoid matrix and mention chondrosarcoma so you should be very specific in the usage of terminologies you should be very clear as to what you are using and in which case you are using okay the same way with monoosteotic lesions or polyosteotic lesions so these things will vary accordingly okay now we'll come to the next case a 25 year old man with progressive speech difficulty identify the sequences and give me the responses okay most of you are trying uh, identifying the sequences correctly so now uh, write the finding also
Okay. Since most of you are attempting it correctly, we'll proceed to the next. Uh, the sequences mentioned are like uh, most of you have mentioned are a diffusion with ADC and a flare image. The, it shows focal multiple focal areas of the diffusion, which appears hyperintense from there. Okay. The diag most of you have got it correct. It can be a case of it is most likely a case of acute infarct. Okay, now they are given even a contrast. So how does the contrast change the scenario? In this case, that area which is getting impacted or what we suspected as impact shows mild enhancement. Now, how will we proceed? Okay, so the point which you should all know is it is a case of acute to subacute infarct, but always know this a uh, subacute, early subacute infarct, or even sometimes an acute infarct can show focal areas of post contrast enhancement. So you should not get confused whenever, which happens most of the times in when uh, there is no radiologist monitoring the case, and if it is left to a technician, he normally does off a sequence which is. Uh, the uh, neurologist to the asked for a contrast in an MRI, not even bother to look at it, and then he would have done a contrast. So, but irrespective of whether there is an enhancement on post contrast images, you sh should stick to your diagnosis that it is a case of infarct. Ideally, in these cases, normally a complementary MRI would have been done, but in this case, it was not done. Okay, as uh, you can see that there are multiple focal areas of narrowing here as well as here. So, as somebody had mentioned in the report, in the chat section, okay, it is a case of CNS vasculitis which showed multiple focal patchy areas of subacute infarcts with enhancement. In the CT angiography which was done, it shows irregular bleeding of the bilateral middle cerebral arteries as well as the ICA which are concerning for vasculitis. Okay. So the important point to note is to identify all these findings and to come arrive at a diagnosis of a CNS vasculitis. Point to be noted again here it is that it is not mandatory you will find adromatous changes because the uh, reason for the narrowing of these arteries are inflammatory which is vasculitis. Okay and then in clinically you will find that in CNS vasculitis suspected it can correlate with other clinical findings including lumbar puncture and toxicology. So whenever a case of infarct comes, it is natural that you will proceed on to involve the various, uh, what you call the arteries, what are the various arteries, what are the structures it is supplying. And then you should know when it is a medial uh, lenticular stride, it involves the caudate. The lateral will include the basal ganglia region. So you should also know about the watershed zone territories. So these are very, very important. These images are very important for you to identify the areas and because Invariably, the most asked, important questions which are to be asked are the uh, supply of the lenticular striate arteries as well as the penetrating branches of P1. Understand whenever the thalamus is involved, it is a posterior circulation and whenever the caudate and the basal ganglia are involved, it is the anterior circulation. So most of the times when we see the mistake which is made is a thalamus being represented as an anterior circulation, which is not the case. Okay. So... <clears throat> You look for the narrowings here in these areas like this. You have to look at it in the coronal section for any narrowing and look for any lenticular site arteries if you can. Ideally, a DSA is preferable in these cases to look for narrowing. Okay. Since you completed the arterial anatomy, I will also suggest that you learn about the penis anatomy. Okay. Okay. So with this, we have completed the four cases which I have scheduled for today. So with this, we have. Uh, I will finish the last five minutes with a few spotters for you people exactly five spotters 
okay okay your time starts now anybody who is interested can type the report okay uh these are spotters so i expect you people to be spot on yeah this is a case of lymphangioma abdominal lymphangioma now next case people who are typing it are typing it partially correct look at the image in full okay So excellent it's a case of urethral seal with calculus it's a easy spotter and the condition is also equally important shimitar is a sign yes and it's seen in case of inferior pa pvc okay see hey, now next one all of you are going wrong in this one okay it was a very simple one look for pneumobilia of course there is associated uh, small bowel obstruction yes it is important for you people to observe the right hypocondrium in any abdominal x ray okay the last okay a uh, few of you are trying to get it correct but i the condition is cranial stenosis is the exam okay with the vp shunt excellent okay so with this i have tried to complete the case for today any doubts or anything Pendra uh yes sir uh, so thank you and it was a wonderful uh, class sir and uh, i think it was the most beneficial class for all the exam going post graduates and even other post graduates and uh, uh, any queries you can just type in uh, all the participants actually we never had so much of interaction in earlier classes sir so this was uh, something new to us <laughs> thanks to you no it's a, the idea is to ensure that they write it down it's very important that they write down their findings okay yes sir thank you so much sir uh, it was a pleasure having you here and uh, we hope to have you very often sir with such wonderful uh, uh, cases and uh, classes sir sure sure i'll try my best to be there very frequently and uh, yeah that, that's it for today and uh, hope everyone uh, uh, find it beneficial and i'm sure uh, many more uh, classes to come from sir also and uh, if you have got any other feedback feel free to give it to dr upendra he will uh, share the same thing with me yeah definitely you can all uh, give the feedback on the email id that you have my email id and uh, and also the whatsapp uh, group that is formed for this so you can always uh, give any feedback and uh, yeah here we come to the end of this class for today thank you everyone for joining and hope to see you all again the next week okay thank you so much so we'll end the class here sir okay thank you bro thank you sir